Sesame and Lilies. By John Ruskin. Introductory Note. John Ruskin, 1819-1900, the greatest master of ornate prose in the English language, was born in London and educated at Oxford. He studied painting, and became a graceful and accurate draftsman, but he early transferred his main energies from the production to the criticism and teaching of art. In 1843 appeared the first volume of Modern Painters and succeeding volumes continued to be published till it was completed by the fifth in 1860. The startling originality of this work, both in style and in the nature of its aesthetic theories, brought the author at once into prominence, though for some time he was more attacked than followed. Meanwhile he extended his scope to include other fields. In The Seven Lamps of Architecture, 1849, and The Stones of Venice, 1851-53 he applied his theories to architecture, in Pre-Raphaelitism, 1851, he came to the defense of the new school of art then beginning to agitate England, in Unto This Last, 1861, and many other writings he attacked the current political economy. In spite of the great variety of the themes of Ruskin's numerous volumes, there are to be found, underlying the eloquent argument, exposition, and exhortation of all, a few persistent principles. The application of these principles in one place is often inconsistent with that in another, and Ruskin frankly reversed his opinion with great frequency in successive editions of the same work, yet he continued to use a dogmatic tone which is at once his strength and his weakness. The two lectures which constitute Sesame and Lilies deal ostensibly with the reading of books, but in characteristic fashion the author brings into the discussion his favorite ideas on ethics, aesthetics, economics, and many other subjects. It thus gives a fairly comprehensive idea of the nature of the widespread influence which he exerted on English life and thought during the whole of the second half of the 19th century. Its style also, in its earnestness, its richness, and its lofty eloquence, exemplifies the pitch to which he brought the tradition of the highly decorated prose cultivated by de Quincey in the previous generation, a pitch of gorgeousness in color and cadence which has been surpassed by none. Sesame and Lilies. Lecture 1 Sesame of King's Treasuries. You shall each have a cake of sesame, and ten pound. Lucian, the fisherman. My first duty this evening is to ask your pardon for the ambiguity of title under which the subject of this lecture has been announced, for indeed I am not going to talk of kings, known as regnant, nor of treasuries, understood to contain wealth, but of quite another order of royalty, and another material of riches, than those usually acknowledged. I had even intended to ask your attention for a little while on trust, and, as sometimes one contrives. In taking a friend to see a favorite piece of scenery, to hide what I wanted most to show, with such imperfect cunning as I might, until we unexpectedly reached the best point of view by winding paths. But, and as also I have heard it said, by men practiced in public address, that hearers are never so much fatigued as by the endeavor to follow a speaker who gives them no clue to his purposes, I will take the slight mask off at once and tell you plainly that I want to speak to you about the treasures hidden in books, and about the way we find them, and the way we lose them. A grave subject, you will say, and a wide one. Yes. So wide that I shall make no effort to touch the compass of it. I will try only to bring before you a few simple thoughts about reading, which press themselves upon me every day more deeply as I watch the course of the public mind with respect to our daily enlarging means of education, and the answeringly wider spreading on the levels, of the irrigation of literature. 2. It happens that I have practically some connection with schools for different classes of youth, and I receive many letters from parents respecting the education of their children. In the mass of these letters I am always struck by the precedence which the idea of a position in life takes above all other thoughts in the parents more especially in the mother's, minds. The education befitting such and such a station in life this is the phrase, this the object, always. They never seek, as far as I can make out, an education good in itself, even the conception of abstract rightness in training rarely seems reached by the writers. But, an education which shall keep a good coat on my son's back, which shall enable him to ring with confidence the visitor's bell at doubled belled doors. 
which shall result ultimately in establishment of a double-belled daughter his own house, in a word, which shall lead to advancement in life, this we pray for on bent knees, and this is all we pray for. It never seems to occur to the parents that there may be an education which, in itself, is advancement in life, that any other than that may perhaps be advancement in death, and that this essential education might be more easily got, or given, than they fancy, if they set about it in the right way, while it is for no price, and by no favor, to be got, if they set about it in the wrong. 3. Indeed, among the ideas most prevalent and effective in the mind of this busiest of countries, I suppose the first, at least that which is confessed with the greatest frankness, and put forward as the fittest stimulus to youthful exertion, is this of advancement in life. May I ask you to consider with me what this idea practically includes, and what it should include. Practically, then, at present, advancement in life means, becoming conspicuous in life, obtaining a position which shall be acknowledged by others to be respectable or honorable. We do not understand by this advancement in general, the mere making of money, but the being known to have made it, not the accomplishment of any great aim, but the being seen to have accomplished it. In a word, we mean the gratification of our thirst for applause. That thirst, if the last infirmity of noble minds, is also the first infirmity of weak ones, and, on the whole, the strongest impulsive influence of average humanity, the greatest efforts of the race have always been traceable to the love of praise, as its greatest catastrophes to the love of pleasure. 4. I am not about to attack or defend this impulse. I want you only to feel how it lies at the root of effort, especially of all modern effort. It is the gratification of vanity which is, with us, the stimulus of toil, and balm of repose, so closely does it touch the very springs of life that the wounding of our vanity is always spoken of, and truly, as in its measure mortal, we call it mortification, using the same expression which we should apply to a gangrenous and incurable bodily hurt. And although few of us may be physicians enough to recognize the various effect of this passion upon health and energy, I believe most honest men know, and would at once acknowledge, its leading power with them as a motive. The seaman does not commonly desire to be made captain only because he knows he can manage the ship better than any other sailor on board. He wants to be made captain that he may be called captain. The clergyman does not usually want to be made a bishop only because he believes no other hand can, as firmly as his, direct the diocese through its difficulties. He wants to be made bishop primarily that he may be called my lord. And a prince does not usually desire to enlarge, or a subject to gain, a kingdom, because he believes that no one else can as well serve the state, upon its throne, but, briefly, because he wishes to be addressed as your majesty by as many lips as may be brought to such utterance. 5. This, then, being the main idea of advancement in life, the force of it applies, for all of us, according to our station, particularly to that secondary result of such advancement which we call getting into good society. We want to get into good society, not that we may have it, but that we may be seen in it, and our notion of its goodness depends primarily on its conspicuousness. Will you pardon me if I pause for a moment to put what I fear you may think an impertinent question? I never can go on with an address unless I feel, or know, that my audience are either with me or against me, I do not much care which, in beginning, but I must know where they are, and I would fain find out, at this instant, whether you think I am putting the motives of popular action too low. I am resolved, tonight, to state them low enough to be admitted as probable, for whenever, in my writings on political economy, I assume that a little honesty, or generosity, or what used to be called virtue may be calculated upon as a human motive of action. People always answer me, saying, you must not calculate on that, that is not in human nature, you must not assume anything to be common to men but acquisitiveness and jealousy, no other feeling ever has influence on them, except accidentally, and in matters out of the way of business. I begin, accordingly, tonight low in the scale of motives. But I must know if you think me right in doing so. Therefore, 
Let me ask those who admit the love of praise to be usually the strongest motive in men's minds in seeking advancement, and the honest desire of doing any kind of duty to be an entirely secondary one, to hold up their hands. About a dozen of hands held up, the audience, partly not being sure the lecturer is serious, and, partly, shy of expressing opinion. I am quite serious, I really do want to know what you think, however, I can judge by putting the reverse question. Will those who think that duty is generally the first, and love of praise the second, motive, hold up their hands? One hand reported to have been held up, behind the lecturer, very good, I see you are with me, and that you think I have not begun too near the ground. Now, without teasing you by putting farther question, I venture to assume that you will admit duty as at least a secondary or tertiary motive. You think that the desire of doing something useful, or obtaining some real good, is indeed an existent collateral idea, though a secondary one, in most men's desire of advancement. You will grant that moderately honest men desire place and office, at least in some measure, for the sake of beneficent power, and would wish to associate rather with sensible and well-informed persons than with fools and ignorant persons, whether they are seen in the company of the sensible ones or not. And finally, without being troubled by a repetition of any common truisms about the preciousness of friends, and the influence of companions, you will admit, doubtless that according to the sincerity of our desire that our friends may be true, and our companions wise, and in proportion to the earnestness and discretion with which we choose both, will be the general chances of our happiness and usefulness. 6. But, granting that we had both the will and the sense to choose our friends well, how few of us have the power, or, at least, how limited, for most, is the sphere of choice. Nearly all our associations are determined by chance, or necessity, and restricted within a narrow circle. We cannot know whom we would, and those whom we know, we cannot have at our side when we most need them. All the higher circles of human intelligence are, to those beneath, only momentarily and partially open. We may, by good fortune, obtain a glimpse of a great poet, and hear the sound of his voice, or put a question to a man of science, and be answered good humouredly. We may intrude ten minutes' talk on a cabinet minister, answered probably with words worse than silence, being deceptive, or snatch, once or twice in our lives. The privilege of throwing a bouquet in the path of a princess, or arresting the kind glance of a queen. And yet these momentary chances we covet, and spend our years, and passions, and powers in pursuit of little more than these, while, meantime, there is a society continually open to us, of people who will talk to us as long as we like, whatever our rank or occupation, talk to us in the best words they can choose, and of the things nearest their hearts. And this society, because it is so numerous and so gentle, and can be kept waiting round us all day long, kings and statesmen lingering patiently, not to grant audience, but to gain it. In those plainly furnished and narrow anterooms, our bookcase shelves, we make no account of that company, perhaps never listen to a word they would say, all day long. 7. You may tell me, perhaps, or think within yourselves, that the apathy with which we regard this company of the noble, who are praying us to listen to them, and the passion with which we pursue the company, probably of the ignoble who despise us, or who have nothing to teach us, are grounded in this, that we can see the faces of the living men, and it is themselves, and not their sayings, with which we desire to become familiar. But it is not so. Suppose you never were to see their faces, suppose you could be put behind the screen in the statesman's cabinet, or the prince's chamber, would you not be glad to listen to their words, though you were forbidden to advance beyond the screen? And when the screen is only a little less, folded in two instead of four, and you can be hidden behind the cover of the two boards that bind a book, and listen all day long, not to the casual talk, but to the studied, determined, chosen addresses of the wisest of men, this station of audience, and honourable privy council, you despise. 8. But perhaps you will say that it is because the living people talk of things that are passing, and are of immediate interest to you, that you desire to hear them. Nay, that cannot be so, for the living people will themselves tell you about passing matters, much better in their writings than in their careless talk. 
but I admit that this motive does influence you, so far as you prefer those rapid and ephemeral writings to slow and enduring writings, books, properly so called. For all books are divisible into two classes, the books of the hour, and the books of all time. Mark this distinction, it is not one of quality only. It is not merely the bad book that does not last, and the good one that does. It is a distinction of species. There are good books for the hour, and good ones for all time, bad books for the hour, and bad ones for all time. I must define the two kinds before I go farther. 9. The good book of the hour, then, I do not speak of the bad ones, is simply the useful or pleasant talk of some person whom you cannot otherwise converse with, printed for you. Very useful often, telling you what you need to know, very pleasant often, as a sensible friend's present talk would be. These bright accounts of travels, good humored and witty discussions of question, lively or pathetic storytelling in the form of novel, firm fact telling, by the real agents concerned in the events of passing history, all these books of the hour, multiplying among us as education becomes more general, are a peculiar possession of the present age. We ought to be entirely thankful for them, and entirely ashamed of ourselves if we make no good use of them. But we make the worst possible use if we allow them to usurp the place of true books, for strictly speaking, they are not books at all, but merely letters or newspapers in good print. Our friend's letter may be delightful, or necessary, today, whether worth keeping or not, is to be considered. The newspaper may be entirely proper at breakfast time, but assuredly it is not reading for all day. So, though bound up in a volume, the long letter which gives you so pleasant an account of the inns, and roads, and weather last year at such a place, or which tells you that amusing story, or gives you the real circumstances of such and such events, however valuable for occasional reference, may not be, in the real sense of the word, a book at all, nor in the real sense, to be read. A book is essentially not a talked thing, but a written thing, and written, not with the view of mere communication, but of permanence. The book of talk is printed only because its author cannot speak to thousands of people at once, if he could, he would, the volume is mere multiplication of his voice. You cannot talk to your friend in India, if you could, you would, you write instead, that is mere conveyance of voice. But a book is written, not to multiply the voice merely, not to carry it merely, but to perpetuate it. The author has something to say which she perceives to be true and useful, or helpfully beautiful. So far as he knows, no one has yet said it, so far as he knows, no one else can say it. He is bound to say it, clearly and melodiously if he may, clearly, at all events. In the sum of his life he finds this to be the thing, or group of things, manifest to him, this, the piece of true knowledge, or sight, which his share of sunshine and earth has permitted him to seize. He would fain set it down forever, engrave it on rock, if he could, saying, this is the best of me, for the rest, I ate, and drank, and slept, loved, and hated, like another, my life was as the vapor and is not. But this I saw and knew, this if anything of mine, is worth your memory. That is his writing, it is, in his small human way and with whatever degree of true inspiration is in him his inscription, or scripture. That is a book. 10. Perhaps you think no books were ever so written. But, again, I ask you, do you at all believe in honesty, or at all in kindness? Or do you think there is never any honesty or benevolence in wise people? None of us, I hope, are so unhappy as to think that. Well, whatever bit of a wise man's work is honestly and benevolently done, that bit is his book, or his piece of art. It is mixed always with evil fragments, ill done, redundant, affected work. But if you read rightly, you will easily discover the true bits, and those are the book. 11. Now books of this kind have been written in all ages by their greatest men, by great readers, great statesmen, and great thinkers. These are all at your choice, and life is short. You have heard as much before, yet have you measured and mapped out this short life and its possibilities? Do you know, if you read this, that you cannot read that, that what you lose today you cannot gain tomorrow? Will you go and gossip with your housemaid, 
or your stable boy, when you may talk with queens and kings, or flatter yourselves that it is with any worthy consciousness of your own claims to respect that you jostle with the hungry and common crowd for entree here, and audience there, when all the while this eternal court is open to you, with its society. Why does the world, multitudinous as it stays, the chosen, and the mighty, of every place and time? Into that you may enter always, in that you may take fellowship and rank according to your wish, from that, once entered into it, you can never be outcast but by your own fault, by your aristocracy of companionship there. Your own inherent aristocracy will be assuredly tested, and the motives with which you strive to take high place in the society of the living, measured, as to all the truth and sincerity that are in them, by the place you desire to take in this company of the dead. 12. The place you desire, and the place you fit yourself for, I must also say, because, observe, this court of the past differs from all living aristocracy in this, it is open to labor and to merit, but to nothing else. No wealth will bribe, no name overawe, no artifice deceive, the guardian of those Elysian gates. In the deep sense, no vile or vulgar person ever enters there. At the portiers of that silent Faubourg Saint Germain, there is but brief question. Do you deserve to enter? Pass. Do you ask to be the companion of nobles? Make yourself noble, and you shall be. Do you long for the conversation of the wise? Learn to understand it, and you shall hear it. But on other terms? No. If you will not rise to us, we cannot stoop to you. The living lord may assume courtesy, the living philosopher explain his thought to you with considerate pain, but here we neither feign nor interpret. You must rise to the level of our thoughts if you would be gladdened by them, and share our feelings, if you would recognize our presence. 13. This, then, is what you have to do, and I admit that it is much. You must, in a word, love these people, if you are to be among them. No ambition is of any use. They scorn your ambition. You must love them, and show your love in these two following ways. I, first, by a true desire to be taught by them, and to enter into their thoughts. To enter into theirs, observe, not to find your own expressed by them. If the person who wrote the book is not wiser than you, you need not read it, if he be, he will think differently from you in many respects. Very ready we are to say of her book, how good this is, that's exactly what I think. But the right feeling is, how strange that is. I never thought of that before, and yet I see it is true, or if I do not now. I hope I shall, some day. But whether thus submissively or not, at least be sure that you go to the author to get at his meaning, not to find yours. Judge it afterwards, if you think yourself qualified to do so, but ascertain it first. And be sure also, if the author is worth anything, that you will not get at his meaning all at once, nay, that at his whole meaning you will not for a long time arrive in any wise. Not that he does not say what he means, and in strong words too. But he cannot say it all, and what is more strange, will not, but in a hidden way and in parables, in order that he may be sure you want it. I cannot quite see the reason of this, nor analyze that cruel reticence in the breasts of wise men which makes them always hide their deeper thought. They do not give it to you by way of help, but of reward, and will make themselves sure that you deserve it before they allow you to reach it. But it is the same with the physical type of wisdom, gold. There seems, to you and me, no reason why the electric forces of the earth should not carry whatever there is of gold within it at once to the mountain tops. So that kings and people might know that all the gold they could get was there, and without any trouble of digging, or anxiety, or chance, or waste of time, cut it away, and coin as much as they needed. But nature does not manage it so. She puts it in little fissures in the earth, nobody knows where, you may dig long and find none, you must dig painfully to find any. 14. And it is just the same with men's best wisdom. When you come to a good book, you must ask yourself, am I inclined to work as an Australian miner would? Are my pickaxes and shovels in good order, and am I in good trim myself, my sleeves well up to the elbow, and my breath good, and my temper? 
and, keeping the figure a little longer, even at the cost of tiresomeness, for it is a thoroughly useful one, the metal you are in search of being the author's mind or meaning, his words are as the rock which you have to crush and smelt in order to get at it. And your pickaxes are your own care, wit, and learning. Your smelting furnace is your own thoughtful soul. Do not hope to get at any good author's meaning without those tools and that fire, often you will need sharpest, finest chiseling, and patientest fusing, before you can gather one grain of the metal. 15. And therefore, first of all, I tell you, earnestly and authoritatively, I know I am right in this, you must get into the habit of looking intensely at words, and assuring yourself of their meaning, syllable by syllable, nay letter by letter. For though it is only by reason of the opposition of letters in the function of signs, to sounds in the function of signs, that the study of books is called literature, and that a man versed in it is called, by the consent of nations, a man of letters instead of a man of books, or of words, you may yet connect with that accidental nomenclature this real fact, that you might read all the books in the British Museum, if you could live long enough, and remain an utterly illiterate, uneducated person, but that if you read ten pages of a good book, letter by letter, that is to say, with real accuracy, you are forever more in some measure an educated person. The entire difference between education and non-education, as regards the merely intellectual part of it, consists in this accuracy. A well-educated gentleman may not know many languages, may not be able to speak any but his own, may have read very few books. But whatever language he knows, he knows precisely, whatever word he pronounces, he pronounces rightly, above all, he is learned in the peerage of words, knows the words of true descent and ancient blood at a glance, from words of modern Kanai, remembers all their ancestry, their intermarriages, distant relationships, and the extent to which they were admitted, and offices they held, among the national noblesse of words at any time, and in any country. But an uneducated person may know, by memory, many languages, and talk them all, and yet truly know not a word of any, not a word even of his own. An ordinarily clever and sensible seaman will be able to make his way ashore at most ports, yet he has only to speak a sentence of any language to be known for an illiterate person. So also the accent, or turn of expression of a single sentence, will at once mark a scholar. And this is so strongly felt, so conclusively admitted by educated persons, that a false accent or a mistaken syllable is enough, in the parliament of any civilized nation, to assign to a man a certain degree of inferior standing forever. 16. And this is right, but it is a pity that the accuracy insisted on is not greater, and required to a serious purpose. It is right that a false Latin quantity should excite a smile in the House of Commons. But it is wrong that a false English meaning should not excite a frown there. Let the accent of words be watched, and closely, let their meaning be watched more closely still, and fewer will do the work. A few words well chosen and distinguished, will do work that a thousand cannot, when every one is acting, equivocally, in the function of another. Yes, and words, if they are not watched, will do deadly work sometimes. There are masked words droning and skulking about us in Europe just now, dash there never were so many, owing to the spread of a shallow, blotching, blundering, infectious information, or rather defamation, everywhere, and to the teaching of catechisms and phrases at schools instead of human meanings, there are masked words abroad, I say, which nobody understands, but which everybody uses, and most people will also fight for, live for, or even die for, fancying they mean this or that, or the other, of things dear to them. For such words wear chameleon cloaks, ground lion cloaks, of the color of the ground of any man's fancy, on that ground they lie in wait, and rend him with a spring from it. There never were creatures of prey so mischievous, never diplomatists so cunning, never poisoners so deadly, as these masked words. They are the unjust stewards of all men's ideas, whatever fancy or favorite instinct a man most cherishes, he gives to his favorite masked word to take care of for him, the word at last comes to have an infinite power over him, you cannot get at him but by its ministry. 17. And in languages so mongrel in breed as the English, 
there is a fatal power of equivocation put into men's hands, almost whether they will or no, in being able to use Greek or Latin words for an idea when they want it to be awful, and Saxon or otherwise common words when they want it to be vulgar. What a singular and salutary effect, for instance, would be produced on the minds of people who are in the habit of taking the form of the word they live by, for the power of which that word tells them, if we always either retained, or refused, the Greek form biblos, or biblion, as the right expression for book instead of employing it only in the one instance in which we wished to give dignity to the idea, and translating it into English everywhere else. How wholesome it would be for many simple persons, if, in such places, for instance, as Acts 19. 19, we retained the Greek expression, instead of translating it, and they had to read, many of them also which used curious arts, brought their Bibles together, and burnt them before all men, and they counted the price of them, and found it fifty thousand pieces of silver. Or, if, on the other hand, we translated where we retain it, and always spoke of the holy book. Instead of holy Bible, it might come into more heads than it does at present, that the word of God, by which the heavens were, of old, and by which they are now kept in store, cannot be made a present of to anybody in Morocco binding, nor sewn on any wayside by help either of steam plow or steam press. But is nevertheless being offered to us daily, and by us with contumely refused, and sewn in us daily, and by us, as instantly as may be, choked. 18. So, again, consider what effect has been produced on the English vulgar mind by the use of the sonorous Latin form damno, in translating the Greek chatacrino, when people charitably wish to make it forcible, and the substitution of the temperate condemn for it, when they choose to keep it gentle. And what notable sermons have been preached by illiterate clergymen on, he that believeth not shall be damned, though they would shrink with horror from translating Heb. 11. 7. The saving of his house, by which he damned the world, or John the Eighth. 10. 11. Woman, hath no man damned thee? She saith, No man, Lord. Jesus answered her, Neither do I damn thee, go and sin no more. And divisions in the mind of Europe, which have cost seas of blood and in the defence of which the noblest souls of men have been cast away in frantic desolation, countless as forest leaves, though, in the heart of them. Founded on deeper causes, have nevertheless been rendered practicably possible, namely, by the European adoption of the Greek word for a public meeting, ecclesia, to give peculiar respectability to such meetings. When held for religious purposes, and other collateral equivocations, such as the vulgar English one of using the word priest as a contraction for presbyter. 19. Now, in order to deal with words rightly, this is the habit you must form. Nearly every word in your language has been first a word of some other language, of Saxon, German, French, Latin, or Greek, not to speak of Eastern and primitive dialects. And many words have been all these, that is to say, have been Greek first. Latin next, French and German next, and English last, undergoing a certain change of sense and use on the lips of each nation, but retaining a deep vital meaning, which all good scholars feel in employing them, even at this day. If you do not know the Greek alphabet, learn it, young or old, girl or boy, whoever you may be. If you think of reading seriously, which, of course, implies that you have some leisure at command, learn your Greek alphabet, then get good dictionaries of all these languages, and whenever you are in doubt about a word, hunt it down patiently. Read Max Muller's lectures thoroughly, to begin with, and, after that, never let a word escape you that looks suspicious. It is severe work, but you will find it, even at first, interesting, and at last, endlessly amusing and the general gain to your character, in power and precision, will be quite incalculable. Mind, this does not imply knowing, or trying to know, Greek or Latin, or French. It takes a whole life to learn any language perfectly. But you can easily ascertain the meanings through which the English word has passed, and those which in a good writer's work it must still bear. 20. And now, merely for example's sake, I will with your permission, read a few lines of a true book with you, carefully, and see what will come out of them. 
I will take a book perfectly known to you all. No English words are more familiar to us, yet few perhaps have been read with less sincerity. I will take these few following lines of Lycidas. Last came, and last did go. The pilot of the Galilean lake. Two massy keys he bore of metals twain. The golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks, and stern bespake. How well could I have sparred for thee, young swain! In hour of such as for their bellies' sake. Creep, and intrude, and climb into the fold. Of other care they little reckoning make. Than how to scramble at the shearer's feast. And shove away the worthy bidden guest. Blind mouths, that scarce themselves know how to hold. A sheep hook, or have learned aught else, the least that to the faithful herdsman's art belongs. What wrecks it them? What need they? They are sped. And when they list, their lean and flashy songs. Great on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw. The hungry sheep look up, and are not fed. But, swollen with wind, and the rank mist they draw. Rot inwardly, and foul contagion spread. Besides what the grim wolf with privy paw. Daily devours apace, and nothing said. Let us think over this passage, and examine its words. First, is it not singular to find Milton assigning to Saint Peter, not only his full episcopal function, but the very types of it which Protestants usually refuse most passionately, his mitred locks? Milton was no bishop lover. How comes Saint Peter to be mitred? Two massy keys he bore. Is this, then, the power of the keys claimed by the bishops of Rome, and is it acknowledged here by Milton only in a poetical license, for the sake of its picturesqueness, that he may get the gleam of the golden keys to help his effect? Do not think it. Great men do not play stage tricks with doctrines of life and death. Only little men do that. Milton means what he says, and means it with his might too, is going to put the whole strength of his spirit presently into the saying of it. For though not a lover of false bishops, he was a lover of true ones. And the lake pilot is here, in his thoughts, the type and head of true episcopal power. For Milton reads the text, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven quite honestly. Puritan though he be. He would not blot it out of the book because there have been bad bishops, nay, in order to understand him, we must understand that verse first, it will not do to eye it askance, or whisper it under our breath, as if it were a weapon of an adverse sect. It is a solemn, universal assertion, deeply to be kept in mind by all sects. But perhaps we shall be better able to reason on it if we go on a little farther, and come back to it. For clearly this marked insistence on the power of the true episcopate is to make us feel more weightily what is to be charged against the false claimants of episcopate, or generally, against false claimants of power and rank in the body of the clergy, they who, for their bellies' sake, creep, and intrude, and climb into the fold. 21. Never think Milton uses those three words to fill up his verse, as a loose writer would. He needs all the three, especially those three, and no more than those, creep, and intrude, and climb, no other words would or could serve the turn, and no more could be added. For they exhaustively comprehend the three classes. Correspondent to the three characters, of men who dishonestly seek ecclesiastical power. First, those who creep into the fold, who do not care for office, nor name, but for secret influence, and do all things occultly and cunningly, consenting to any servility of office or conduct, so only that they may intimately discern. And unawares direct, the minds of men. Then those who intrude, thrust, that is, themselves into the fold, who by natural insolence of heart, and stout eloquence of tongue, and fearlessly perseverant self-assertion, obtain hearing and authority with the common crowd. Lastly, those who climb, who by labor and learning, both stout and sound, but selfishly exerted in the cause of their own ambition, gain high dignities and authorities, and become lords over the heritage, though not in samples to the flock. 22. Now go on. Of other care they little reckoning make. Than how to scramble at the shearer's feast. Blind mouths. 
I pause again, for this is a strange expression, a broken metaphor, one might think, careless and unscholarly. Not so, its very audacity and pithiness are intended to make us look close at the phrase and remember it. Those two monosyllables express the precisely accurate contraries of right character, in the two great offices of the church, those of bishop and pastor. A bishop means a person who sees. A pastor means a person who feeds. The most unbishoply character a man can have is therefore to be blind. The most unpastoral is, instead of feeding, to want to be fed, to be a mouth. Take the two reverses together, and you have blind mouths. We may advisably follow out this idea a little. Nearly all the evils in the church have arisen from bishops desiring power more than light. They want authority, not outlook. Whereas their ill office is not to rule, though it may be vigorously to exhort and rebuke, it is the king's office to rule, the bishop's office is to oversee the flock, to number it, sheep by sheep, to be ready always to give full account of it. Now it is clear he cannot give account of the souls. If he has not so much as numbered the bodies of his flock, the first thing, therefore, that a bishop has to do is at least to put himself in a position in which, at any moment, he can obtain the history, from childhood, of every living soul in his diocese, and of its present state. Down in that back street, Bill and Nancy, knocking each other's teeth out. Does the bishop know all about it? Has he his eye upon them? Has he had his eye upon them? Can he circumstantially explain to us how Bill got into the habit of beating Nancy about the head? If he cannot, he is no bishop, though he had a mitre as high as Salisbury steeple, he is no bishop, he has sought to be at the helm instead of the masthead, he has no sight of things. Nay, you say, it is not his duty to look after Bill in the back street. What? The fat sheep that have full fleeces, you think it is only those he should look after, while, go back to your Milton, the hungry sheep look up, and are not fed, besides what the grim wolf with privy paw, bishops knowing nothing about it, daily devours apace, and nothing said? But that's not our idea of a bishop. Perhaps not, but it was St. Paul's, and it was Milton's. They may be right, or we may be but we must not think we are reading either one or the other by putting our meaning into their words. 23. I go on. But, swollen with wind, and the rank mist they draw. This is to meet the vulgar answer that if the poor are not looked after in their bodies, they are in their souls, they have spiritual food. And Milton says, they have no such thing as spiritual food, they are only swollen with wind. At first you may think that is a coarse type, and an obscure one. But again, it is a quite literally accurate one. Take up your Latin and Greek dictionaries, and find out the meaning of spirit. It is only a contraction of the Latin word breath, and an indistinct translation of the Greek word for wind. The same word is used in writing, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and in writing. So is every one that is born of the spirit, born of the breath, that is, for it means the breath of God, in soul and body. We have the true sense of it in our words inspiration and expire. Now, there are two kinds of breath with which the flock may be filled, God's breath, and man's. The breath of God is health, and life, and peace to them, as the air of heaven is to the flocks on the hills, but man's breath, the word which he calls spiritual, is disease and contagion to them, as the fog of the fen. They rot inwardly with it, they are puffed up by it, as a dead body by the vapours of its own decomposition. This is literally true of all false religious teaching, the first and last, and fatalist sign of it is that puffing up. Your converted children, who teach their parents, your converted convicts, who teach honest men, your converted dunces. Who, having lived in cretinous stupefaction half their lives, suddenly awakening to the fact of their being a god. Fancy themselves therefore his peculiar people and messengers, your sectarians of every species, small and great. Catholic or Protestant, of high church or low, in so far as they think themselves exclusively in the right and others wrong, and pre-eminently, in every sect, those who hold that men can be saved by thinking rightly instead of doing rightly. By word instead of act, and wish instead of work, these are the true fog children, clouds, these, without water, 
bodies, these, of putrescent vapor and skin, without blood or flesh, blown bagpipes for the fiends to pipe with, corrupt, and corrupting, swollen with wind, and the rank mist they draw. 24. Lastly, let us return to the lines respecting the power of the keys, for now we can understand them. Note the difference between Milton and Dante in their interpretation of this power, for once, the latter is weaker in thought, he supposes both the keys to be of the gate of heaven, one is of gold, the other of silver. They are given by Saint Peter to the sentinel angel, and it is not easy to determine the meaning either of the substances of the three steps of the gate, or of the two keys. But Milton makes one, of gold, the key of heaven. The other, of iron, the key of the prison in which the wicked teachers are to be bound who have taken away the key of knowledge, yet entered not in themselves. We have seen that the duties of bishop and pastor are to see and feed, and, of all who do so it is said, he that watereth, shall be watered also himself. But the reverse is truth also. He that watereth not, shall be withered himself, and he that seeth not, shall himself be shut out of sight, shut into the perpetual prison house. And that prison opens here, as well as hereafter, he who is to be bound in heaven must first be bound on earth. That command to the strong angels, of which the rock apostle is the image, take him, and bind him hand and foot, and cast him out, issues, in its measure, against the teacher, for every help withheld. And for every truth refused, and for every falsehood enforced, so that he is more strictly fettered the more he fetters, and farther outcast, as he more and more misleads, till at last the bars of the iron cage close upon him, and as the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. 25. We have got something out of the lines, I think, and much more is yet to be found in them, but we have done enough by way of example of the kind of word by word examination of your author which is rightly called reading, watching every accent and expression, and putting ourselves always in the author's place, annihilating our own personality, and seeking to enter into his, so as to be able assuredly to say, thus Milton thought, not thus I thought, in misreading Milton. And by this process you will gradually come to attach less weight to your own. Thus I thought at other times. You will begin to perceive that what you thought was a matter of no serious importance, that your thoughts on any subject are not perhaps the clearest and wisest that could be arrived at thereupon, in fact, that unless you are a very singular person, you cannot be said to have any thoughts at all, that you have no materials for them, in any serious matters, no right to think, but only to try to learn more of the facts. Nay, most probably all your life, unless, as I said, you are a singular person, you will have no legitimate right to an opinion on any business, except that instantly under your hand. What must of necessity be done, you can always find out, beyond question, how to do. Have you a house to keep in order, a commodity to sell, a field to plough, a ditch to cleanse? There need be no two opinions about these proceedings, it is at your peril if you have not much more than an opinion on the way to manage such matters. And also, outside of your own business, there are one or two subjects on which you are bound to have but one opinion. That roguery and lying are objectionable, and are instantly to be flogged out of the way whenever discovered, that covetousness and love of quarrelling are dangerous dispositions even in children. And deadly dispositions in men and nations, that in the end, the God of heaven and earth loves active, modest, and kind people, and hates idle, proud, greedy, and cruel ones, on these general facts you are bound to have but one and that a very strong, opinion. For the rest, respecting religions, governments, sciences, arts, you will find that, on the whole, you can know nothing, judge nothing, that the best you can do, even though you may be a well-educated person, is to be silent, and strive to be wiser every day, and to understand a little more of the thoughts of others, which so soon as you try to do honestly, you will discover that the thoughts even of the wisest are very little more than pertinent questions. To put the difficulty into a clear shape, and exhibit to you the grounds for indecision, that is all they can generally do for you. And well for them and for us, if indeed they are able to mix the music with our thoughts, and sadden us with heavenly doubts. This writer, from whom I have been reading to you, 
is not among the first or wisest, he sees shrewdly as far as he sees, and therefore it is easy to find out his full meaning, but with the greater men. You cannot fathom their meaning, they do not even wholly measure it themselves, it is so wide. Suppose I had asked you, for instance, to seek for Shakespeare's opinion, instead of Milton's, on this matter of church authority? Or for Dante's? Have any of you, at this instant, the least idea what either thought about it? Have you ever balanced the scene with the bishops in Richard III? Against the character of Cranmer? The description of St. Francis and St. Dominic against that of him who made Virgil wonder to gaze upon him, Tistezo, Tancovalment, Nelaterno Asilio, or of him whom Dante stood beside, come Elfred Che confessor lo perfido assassin? Shakespeare and Alighieri knew men better than most of us, I presume. They were both in the midst of the main struggle between the temporal and spiritual powers. They had an opinion, we may guess. But where is it? Bring it into court. Put Shakespeare's or Dante's creed into articles, and send it up for trial by the ecclesiastical courts. 26. You will not be able, I tell you again, for many and many a day, to come at the real purposes and teaching of these great men, but a very little honest study of them will enable you to perceive that what you took for your own judgment was mere chance prejudice, and drifted, helpless, entangled weed of castaway thought. Nay, you will see that most men's minds are indeed little better than rough heath wilderness, neglected and stubborn, partly barren, partly overgrown with pestilent breaks, and venomous, wind sown herbage of evil surmise, that the first thing you have to do for them, and yourself, is eagerly and scornfully to set fire to this. Burn all the jungle into wholesome ash heaps, and then plough and sow. All the true literary work before you, for life, must begin with obedience to that order, break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. 27. Having then faithfully listened to the great teachers, that you may enter into their thoughts, you have yet this higher advance to make, you have to enter into their hearts. As you go to them first for clear sight, so you must stay with them, that you may share at last their just and mighty passion. Passion, or sensation. I am not afraid of the word, still less of the thing. You have heard many outcries against sensation lately, but, I can tell you, it is not less sensation we want, but more. The ennobling difference between one man and another, between one animal and another, is precisely in this, that one feels more than another. If we were sponges, perhaps sensation might not be easily got for us, if we were earthworms, liable at every instant to be cut into by the spade, perhaps too much sensation might not be good for us. But, being human creatures, it is good for us, nay, we are only human in so far as we are sensitive, and our honour is precisely in proportion to our passion. 28. You know I said of that great and pure society of the dead, that it would allow no vain or vulgar person to enter there. What do you think I meant by a vulgar person? What do you yourselves mean by vulgarity? You will find it a fruitful subject of thought, but, briefly, the essence of all vulgarity lies in want of sensation. Simple and innocent vulgarity is merely an untrained and undeveloped bluntness of body and mind. But in true inbred vulgarity, there is a deathful callousness, which, in extremity, becomes capable of every sort of bestial habit and crime. Without fear, without pleasure, without horror, and without pity. It is in the blunt hand and the dead heart, in the diseased habit, in the hardened conscience, that men become vulgar, they are forever vulgar, precisely in proportion as they are incapable of sympathy, of quick understanding, of all that, in deep insistence on the common. But most accurate term, may be called the tact or touch faculty of body and soul, that tact which the mimosa has in trees, which the pure woman has above all creatures, fineness and fullness of sensation beyond reason, the guide and sanctifier of reason itself. Reason can but determine what is true, it is the God-given passion of humanity which alone can recognize what God has made good. 29. We come then to the great concourse of the dead, not merely to know from them what is true, but chiefly to feel with them what is just. Now, to feel with them, we must be like them, and none of us can become that without pains. 
as the true knowledge is disciplined and tested knowledge, not the first thought that comes, so the true passion is disciplined and tested passion, not the first passion that comes. The first that come are the vain, the false, the treacherous, if you yield to them they will lead you wildly and far in vain pursuit, in hollow enthusiasm, till you have no true purpose and no true passion left. Not that any feeling possible to humanity is in itself wrong, but only wrong when undisciplined. Its nobility is in its force and justice, it is wrong when it is weak, and felt for paltry cause. There is a mean wonder, as of a child who sees a juggler tossing golden balls, and this is base, if you will. But do you think that the wonder is ignoble, or the sensationless, with which every human soul is called to watch the golden balls of heaven tossed through the night by the hand that made them? There is a mean curiosity, as of a child opening a forbidden door, or a servant prying into her master's business, and a noble curiosity, questioning, in the front of danger, the source of the great river beyond the sand, the place of the great continents beyond the sea, a nobler curiosity still, which questions of the source of the river of life, and of the space of the continent of heaven, things which the angels desire to look into. So the anxiety is ignoble, with which you linger over the course and catastrophe of an idle tale, but do you think the anxiety is less, or greater, with which you watch, or ought to watch, the dealings of fate and destiny with the life of an agonized nation? Alas! It is the narrowness, selfishness, minuteness, of your sensation that you have to deplore in England at this day, sensation which spends itself in bouquets and speeches, in revelings and junketings, in sham fights and gay puppet shows, while you can look on and see noble nations murdered, man by man, without an effort or a tear. 30. I said minuteness and selfishness of sensation, but in a word, I ought to have said injustice or unrighteousness of sensation. For as in nothing is a gentleman better to be discerned from a vulgar person, so in nothing is a gentle nation, such nations have been, better to be discerned from a mob, than in this, that their feelings are constant and just, results of due contemplation, and of equal thought. You can talk a mob into anything, its feelings may be, usually are, on the whole, generous and right, but it has no foundation for them, no hold of them, you may tease or tickle it into any. At your pleasure, it thinks by infection, for the most part, catching an opinion like a cold, and there is nothing so little that it will not roar itself wild about, when the fit is on, nothing so great but it will forget in an hour, when the fit is past. But a gentleman's or a gentle nation's, passions are just, measured and continuous. A great nation, for instance, does not spend its entire national wits for a couple of months in weighing evidence of a single ruffian's having done a single murder, and for a couple of years see its own children murder each other by their thousands or tens of thousands a day, considering only what the effect is likely to be on the price of cotton, and caring no wise to determine which side of battle is in the wrong. Neither does a great nation send its poor little boys to jail for stealing six walnuts and allow its bankrupts to steal their hundreds or thousands with a bow, and its bankers, rich with poor men's savings, to close their doors under circumstances over which they have no control, with they by your leave. And large landed estates to be bought by men who have made their money by going with armed steamers up and down the China seas, selling opium at the cannon's mouth, and altering, for the benefit of the foreign nation, the common highwayman's demand of your money or your life into that of your money and your life. Neither does a great nation allow the lives of its innocent poor to be parched out of them by fog fever, and rotted out of them by dunghill plague, for the sake of sixpence a life extra per week to its landlords. And then debate, with driveling tears, and diabolical sympathies, whether it ought not piously to save, and nursingly cherish. The lives of its murderers. Also, a great nation having made up its mind that hanging is quite the wholesomest process for its homicides in general, can yet with mercy distinguish between the degrees of guilt in homicides, and does not yelp like a pack of frost-pinched wolf cubs on the blood track of an unhappy crazed boy. Or grey-haired Claude Paterthello, perplexed I the extreme, at the very moment that it is sending a minister of the crown to make polite speeches to a man who is bayoneting young girls in their father's sight, and killing noble youths in cool blood. 
faster than a country butcher kills lambs in spring. And, lastly, a great nation does not mock heaven and its powers. By pretending belief in a revelation with asserts the love of money to be the root of all evil, and declaring, at the same time, that it is actuated, and intends to be actuated, in all chief national deeds and measures, by no other love. 31. My friends, I do not know why any of us should talk about reading. We want some sharper discipline than that of reading, but, at all events, be assured, we cannot read. No reading is possible for a people with its mind in this state. No sentence of any great writer is intelligible to them. It is simply and sternly impossible for the English public, at this moment, to understand any thoughtful writing, so incapable of thought has it become in its insanity of avarice. Happily, our disease is, as yet, little worse than this incapacity of thought, it is not corruption of the inner nature, we ring true still, when anything strikes home to us, and though the idea that everything should pay has infected our every purpose so deeply, that even when we would play the good Samaritan, we never take out our tuppence and give them to the host without saying. When I come again, thou shalt give me fourpence, there is a capacity of noble passion left in our heart's core. We show it in our work, in our war, even in those unjust domestic affections which make us furious at a small private wrong, while we are polite to a boundless public one. We are still industrious to the last hour of the day, though we add the gambler's fury to the laborer's patience, we are still brave to the death, though incapable of discerning true cause for battle, and are still true in affection to our own flesh, to the death, as the sea monsters are, and the rock eagles. And there is hope for a nation while this can be still said of it. As long as it holds its life in its hand, ready to give it for its honor, though a foolish honor, for its love, though a selfish love, and for its business, though a base business, there is hope for it. But hope only, for this instinctive, reckless virtue cannot last. No nation can last, which has made a mob of itself, however generous at heart. It must discipline its passions, and direct them, or they will discipline it, one day, with scorpion whips. Above all a nation cannot last as a money-making mob. It cannot with impunity, it cannot with existence, go on despising literature, despising science, despising art, despising nature, despising compassion, and concentrating its soul on pence. Do you think these are harsh or wild words? Have patience with me but a little longer. I will prove their truth to you, clause by clause. 32. I say first we have despised literature. What do we, as a nation, care about books? How much do you think we spend altogether on our libraries, public or private, as compared with what we spend on our horses? If a man spends lavishly on his library you call him mad, a bibliomaniac. But you never call anyone a horse maniac, though men ruin themselves every day by their horses, and you do not hear of people ruining themselves by their books. Or, to go lower still, how much do you think the contents of the bookshelves of the United Kingdom, public and private, would fetch, as compared with the contents of its wine cellars? What position would its expenditure on literature take, as compared with its expenditure on luxurious eating? We talk of food for the mind, as of food for the body, now a good book contains such food inexhaustibly. It is a provision for life, and for the best part of us, yet how long most people would look at the best book before they would give the price of a large turbot for it. Though there have been men who have pinched their stomachs and bared their backs, to buy a book, whose libraries were cheaper to them, I think, in the end, than most men's dinners are. We are few of us put to such trial, and more the pity, for, indeed, a precious thing is all the more precious to us if it has been won by work or economy, and if public libraries were half as costly as public dinners, or books cost the tenth part of what bracelets do, even foolish men and women might sometimes suspect there was good in reading, as well as in munching and sparkling. Whereas the very cheapness of literature is making even wise people forget that if a book is worth reading, it is worth buying. No book is worth anything which is not worth much, nor is it serviceable, until it has been read, and reread, and loved, and loved again, and marked, so that you can refer to the passages you want in it as a soldier can seize the weapon he needs in an armory, 
or a housewife bring the spice she needs from her store. Bread of flour is good, but there is bread, sweet as honey, if we would eat it, in a good book, and the family must be poor indeed which, once in their lives, cannot, for such multipliable barley loaves. Pay their baker's bill. We call ourselves a rich nation, and we are filthy and foolish enough to thumb each other's books out of circulating libraries. 33. I say we have despised science. What? You exclaim, are we not foremost in all discovery, and is not the whole world giddy by reason, or unreason, of our inventions? Yes, but do you suppose that is national work? That work is all done in spite of the nation, by private people's zeal and money. We are glad enough, indeed, to make our profit of science, we snap up anything in the way of a scientific bone that has meat on it, eagerly enough. But if the scientific man comes for a bone or a crust to us, that is another story. What have we publicly done for science? We are obliged to know what o'clock it is, for the safety of our ships, and therefore we pay for an observatory. And we allow ourselves, in the person of our parliament, to be annually tormented into doing something, in a slovenly way, for the British Museum. Sullenly apprehending that to be a place for keeping stuffed birds in, to amuse our children. If anybody will pay for his own telescope, and resolve another nebula, we cackle over the discernment as if it were our own. If one in ten thousand of our hunting squires suddenly perceives that the earth was indeed made to be something else than a portion for foxes, and burrows in it himself, and tells us where the gold is, and where the coals. We understand that there is some use in that, and very properly knight him, but is the accident of his having found out how to employ himself usefully any credit to us? The negation of such discovery among his brother squires may perhaps be some discredit to us, if we would consider of it. But if you doubt these generalities, here is one fact for us all to meditate upon, illustrative of our love of science. Two years ago there was a collection of the fossils of Solenhofen to be sold in Bavaria, the best in existence, containing many specimens unique for perfectness, and one, unique as an example of a species, a whole kingdom of unknown living creatures being announced by that fossil. This collection, of which the mere market worth, among private buyers, would probably have been some thousand or twelve hundred pounds, was offered to the English nation for seven hundred, but we would not give seven hundred, and the whole series would have been in the Munich Museum at this moment, if Professor Owen had not with loss of his own time and patient tormenting of the British public in person of its representatives, got leave to give four hundred pounds at once, and himself become answerable for the other three, which the said public will doubtless pay him eventually, but sulkily, and caring nothing about the matter all the while, only always ready to cackle if any credit comes of it. Consider. I beg of you, arithmetically, what this fact means. Your annual expenditure for public purposes, a third of it for military apparatus, is at least 50 millions. Now 700 litres. Is to 50 million litres. Roughly. As 7 pence to 2,000 pounds. Suppose then. A gentleman of unknown income, but whose wealth was to be conjectured from the fact that he spent 2,000 a year on his park walls and footmen only, professes himself fond of science and that one of his servants comes eagerly to tell him that an unique collection of fossils, giving clue to a new era of creation, is to be had for the sum of seven pence sterling, and that the gentleman, who is fond of science, and spends two thousand a year on his park, answers, after keeping his servant waiting several months, well, I'll give you four pence for them, if you will be answerable for the extra three pence yourself, till next year. 34. 3. I say you have despised art. What? You again answer, have we not art exhibitions, miles long? And do we not pay thousands of pounds for single pictures? And have we not art schools and institutions? More than ever nation had before? Yes, truly, but all that is for the sake of the shop. You would fain sell canvas as well as coals and crockery as well as iron, you would take every other nation's bread out of its mouth if you could, 
not being able to do that, your ideal of life is to stand in the thoroughfares of the world, like Ludgate apprentices, screaming to every passerby, what do you lack? You know nothing of your own faculties or circumstances, you fancy that, among your damp flat fields of clay, you can have as quick heart fancy as the Frenchman among his bronzed vines, or the Italian under his volcanic cliffs, that art may be learned as bookkeeping is, and when learned, will give you more books to keep. You care for pictures, absolutely, no more than you do for the bills pasted on your dead walls. There is always room on the walls for the bills to be read, never for the pictures to be seen. You do not know what pictures you have, by repute, in the country, nor whether they are false or true, nor whether they are taken care of or not, in foreign countries. You calmly see the noblest existing pictures in the world rotting in abandoned wreck, in Venice you saw the Austrian guns deliberately pointed at the palaces containing them, and if you heard that all the fine pictures in Europe were made into sandbags tomorrow on the Austrian forts, it would not trouble you so much as the chance of a brace or two of game less in your own bags, in a day's shooting. That is your national love of art. 35. 4. You have despised nature, that is to say, all the deep and sacred sensations of natural scenery. The French revolutionists made stables of the cathedrals of France, you have made race courses of the cathedrals of the earth. Your one conception of pleasure is to drive in railroad carriages round their aisles, and eat off their altars. You have put a railroad bridge over the fall of Schaffhausen. You have tunneled the cliffs of Lucerne by Tell's Chapel, you have destroyed the Clarins shore of the Lake of Geneva, there is not a quiet valley in England that you have not filled with bellowing fire, there is no particle left of English land which you have not trampled coal ashes into, nor any foreign city in which the spread of your presence is not marked among its fair old streets and happy gardens by a consuming white leprosy of new hotels and perfumers shops, the Alps themselves which your own poets used to love so reverently. You look upon the soaped poles in a bear garden, which you set yourselves to climb, and slide down again with shrieks of delight. When you are past shrieking, having no human articulate voice to say you are glad with. You fill the quiet shoot of their valleys with gunpowder blasts, and rush home, red with cutaneous eruption of conceit, and voluble with convulsive hiccup of self-satisfaction. I think nearly the two sorrowfulest spectacles I have ever seen in humanity, taking the deep inner significance of them, are the English mobs in the valley of Chimoni, amusing themselves with firing rusty howitzers. And the Swiss vintages of Zurich expressing their Christian thanks for the gift of the vine, by assembling in knots in the towers of the vineyards, and slowly loading and firing horse pistols from morning till evening. It is pitiful to have dim conceptions of duty, more pitiful, it seems to me, to have conceptions like these, of mirth. 36. Lastly. You despise compassion. There is no need of words of mine for proof of this. I will merely print one of the newspaper paragraphs which I am in the habit of cutting out and throwing into my store drawer. Here is one from a daily telegraph of an early date this year, 1867, date which, though by me carelessly left unmarked, is easily discoverable, for on the back of the slip, there is the announcement that yesterday the seventh of the special services of this year was performed by the Bishop of Ripon in St. Paul's, it relates only one of such facts as happen now daily, this, by chance, having taken a form in which it came before the coroner. I will print the paragraph in red. Be sure, the facts themselves are written in that color in a book which we shall all of us, literate or illiterate, have to read our page of, some day. An inquiry was held on Friday by Mr. Richards, Deputy Coroner, at the White Horse Tavern, Christ Church, Spitalfields, respecting the death of Michael Collins, aged 58 years. Mary Collins, a miserable-looking woman, said that she lived with the deceased and his son in a room or two, Cobb's Court, Christ Church. Deceased was a translator of boots. Witness went out and bought old boots, deceased and his son made them into good ones, and then witness sold them for what she could get at the shops, which was very little indeed. Deceased and his son used to work night and day to try and get a little bread and tea, and pay for the room, twos, a week, so as to keep the home together. 
On Friday night week, deceased got up from his bench and began to shiver. He threw down the boots, saying, somebody else must finish them when I am gone, for I can do no more. There was no fire, and he said, I would be better if I was warm. Witness therefore took two pairs of translated boots to sell at the shop, but she could only get 14d. For the two pairs, for the people at the shop said, we must have our profit. Witness got 14 pounds of coal and a little tea and bread. Her son sat up the whole night to make the translations, to get money, but deceased died on Saturday morning. The family never had enough to eat. Coroner, it seems to me deplorable that you did not go into the workhouse. Witness, we wanted the comforts of our little home. A juror asked what the comforts were, for he only saw a little straw in the corner of the room, the windows of which were broken. The witness began to cry, and said that they had a quilt and other little things. The deceased said he never would go into the workhouse. In summer. When the season was good, they sometimes made as much as tens. Profit in a week. They then always saved towards the next week, which was generally a bad one. In winter they made not half so much. For three years they had been getting from bad to worse. Cornelius Collins said that he had assisted his father since 1847. They used to work so far into the night that both nearly lost their eyesight. Witness now had a film over his eyes. Five years ago deceased applied to the parish for aid. The relieving officer gave him a four-pound loaf, and told him if he came again he should get the stones. Fifteen, that disgusted deceased, and he would have nothing to do with them since. They got worse and worse until last Friday week, when they had not even a halfpenny to buy a candle. Deceased then lay down on the straw, and said he could not live till morning. A juror, you are dying of starvation yourself, and you ought to go into the house until the summer. Witness, if we went in we should die. When we come out in the summer we should be like people dropped from the sky. No one would know us, and we would not have even a room. I could work now if I had food, for my sight would get better. Dr. G. P. Walker said deceased died from syncope, from exhaustion, from want of food. The deceased had had no bedclothes. For four months he had had nothing but bread to eat. There was not a particle of fat in the body. There was no disease, but if there had been medical attendance, he might have survived the synop or fainting. The coroner having remarked upon the painful nature of the case, the jury returned the following verdict, that deceased died from exhaustion, from want of food and the common necessaries of life, also through want of medical aid. 37. Why would witness not go into the workhouse? You ask. Well, the poor seem to have a prejudice against the workhouse which the rich have not, for, of course, everyone who takes a pension from government goes into the workhouse on the grand scale. 16. Only the workhouses for the rich do not involve the idea of work, and should be called playhouses. But the poor like to die independently, it appears, perhaps if we made the playhouses for them pretty and pleasant enough. Or gave them their pensions at home, and allowed them a little introductory peculation with the public money, their minds might be reconciled to the conditions. Meantime, here are the facts. We make our relief either so insulting to them, or so painful, that they rather die than take it at our hands, or, for third alternative, we leave them so untaught and foolish that they starve like brute creatures, wild and dumb, not knowing what to do, or what to ask. I say, you despise compassion. If you did not, such a newspaper paragraph would be as impossible in a Christian country as a deliberate assassination permitted in its public streets. 17, Christian did I say? Alas, if we were but wholesomely unchristian, it would be impossible. It is our imaginary Christianity that helps us to commit these crimes, for we revel and luxuriate in our faith, for the lewd sensation of it, dressing it up, like everything else, in fiction. The dramatic Christianity of the organ and aisle, of dawn service and twilight revival, the Christianity which we do not fear to mix the mockery of, pictorially, with our play about the devil, in our Satan Ellers, Roberts, Fausts, chanting hymns through traceried windows for background effect, and artistically modulating the Dio through variation on variation of mimicked prayer. While we distribute tracts, next day, 
for the benefit of uncultivated swearers, upon what we supposed to be the signification of the third commandment, this gaslighted, and gas-inspired, Christianity, we are triumphant in, and draw back the hem of our robes from the touch of the heretics who dispute it. But to do a piece of common Christian righteousness in a plain English word or deed, to make Christian law any rule of life. And found one national act or hope thereon, we know too well what our faith comes to for that. You might sooner get lightning out of incense smoke than true action or passion out of your modern English religion. You had better get rid of the smoke, and the organ pipes, both, leave them, and the gothic windows, and the painted glass. To the property man, give up your carburetted hydrogen ghost in one healthy expiration, and look after Lazarus at the doorstep. For there is a true church wherever one hand meets another helpfully, and that is the only holy or mother church which ever was, or ever shall be. 38. All these pleasures, then, and all these virtues, I repeat, you nationally despise. You have, indeed, men among you who do not, by whose work, by whose strength, by whose life, by whose death, you live, and never thank them. Your wealth, your amusement, your pride, would all be alike impossible, but for those whom you scorn or forget. The policeman, who is walking up and down the black lane all night to watch the guilt you have created there, and may have his brains beaten out, and be maimed for life, at any moment, and never be thanked, the sailor wrestling with the sea's rage, the quiet student poring over his book or his vial, the common worker, without praise, and nearly without bread, fulfilling his task as your horses drag your carts, hopeless, and spurned of all, these are the men by whom England lives, but they are not the nation, they are only the body and nervous force of it. Acting still from old habit in a convulsive perseverance, while the mind is gone. Our national wish and purpose are to be amused. Our national religion is the performance of church ceremonies, and preaching of soporific truths, or untruths, to keep the mob quietly at work, while we amuse ourselves, and the necessity for this amusement is fastening on us as a feverous disease of parched throat and wandering eyes, senseless, dissolute, merciless. How literally that word disease, the negation and impossibility of ease, expresses the entire moral state of our English industry and its amusements. 39. When men are rightly occupied, their amusement grows out of their work, as the color petals out of a fruitful flower, when they are faithfully helpful and compassionate, all their emotions become steady, deep, perpetual, and vivifying to the soul as the natural pulse of the body. But now, having no true business, we pour our whole masculine energy into the false business of money making, and having no true emotion, we must have false emotions dressed up for us to play with. Not innocently, as children with dolls, but guiltily and darkly, as the idolatrous Jews with their pictures on cavern walls, which men had to dig to detect. The justice we do not execute, we mimic in the novel and on the stage, for the beauty we destroy in nature we substitute the metamorphosis of the pantomime. And, the human nature of us imperatively requiring awe and sorrow of some kind, for the noble grief we should have borne with our fellows, and the pure tears we should have wept with them, we gloat over the pathos of the police court, and gather the night dew of the grave. 40. It is difficult to estimate the true significance of these things, the facts are frightful enough, the measure of national fault involved in them is, perhaps, not as great as it would at first seem. We permit, or cause, thousands of deaths daily, but we mean no harm, we set fire to houses, and ravage peasants' fields. Yet we should be sorry to find we had injured anybody. We are still kind at heart, still capable of virtue, but only as children are. Chalmers, at the end of his long life, having had much power with the public, being plagued in some serious matter by a reference to public opinion, uttered the impatient exclamation. The public is just a great baby. And the reason that I have allowed all these graver subjects of thought to mix themselves up with an inquiry into methods of reading, is that, the more I see of our national faults and miseries, the more they resolve themselves into conditions of childish illiterateness, and want of education in the most ordinary habits of thought. It is, I repeat, not vice, not selfishness, 
not dullness of brain, which we have to lament, but an unreachable schoolboy's recklessness, only differing from the true schoolboy's in its incapacity of being helped, because it acknowledges no master. 41. There is a curious type of us given in one of the lovely, neglected works of the last of our great painters. It is a drawing of Kirby Lawnsdale churchyard, and of its brook, and valley, and hills, and folded morning sky beyond. And unmindful alike of these, and of the dead who have left these for other valleys and for other skies, a group of schoolboys have piled their little books upon a grave, to strike them off with stones. So, also, we play with the words of the dead that would teach us, and strike them far from us with our bitter, reckless will, little thinking that those leaves which the wind scatters had been piled, not only upon a gravestone, but upon the seal of an enchanted vault, nay, the gate of a great city of sleeping kings, who would awake for us, and walk with us, if we knew but how to call them by their names. How often, even if we lift the marble entrance gate, do we but wander among those old kings in their repose, and finger the robes they lie in, and stir the crowns on their foreheads, and still they are silent to us, and seem but a dusty imagery, because we know not the incantation of the heart that would wake them, which, if they once heard, they would start up to meet us in their power of long ago, narrowly to look upon us, and consider us, and, as the fallen kings of Hades meet the newly fallen. Saying, Art thou also become weak as we, art thou also become one of us? So would these kings, with their undimmed, unshaken diadems, meet us, saying, Art thou also become pure and mighty of heart as we? Art thou also become one of us? 42. Mighty of heart, mighty of mind, magnanimous to be this, is, indeed, to be great in life, to become this increasingly, is, indeed, to advance in life, in life itself, not in the trappings of it. My friends, do you remember that old Scythian custom, when the head of a house died? How he was dressed in his finest dress, and set in his chariot, and carried about to his friends' houses, and each of them placed him at his table's head, and all feasted in his presence. Suppose it were offered to you, in plain words, as it is offered to you in dire facts, that you should gain this Scythian honour, gradually, while you yet thought yourself alive. Suppose the offer were this. You shall die slowly, your blood shall daily grow cold, your flesh petrified, your heart beat at last only as a rusted group of iron valves. Your life shall fade from you, and sink through the earth into the ice of Kaina, but, day by day, your body shall be dressed more gaily, and set in higher chariots, and have more orders on its breast, crowns on its head, if you will. Men shall bow before it, stare and shout round it, crowd after it up and down the streets, build palaces for it, feast with it at their tables heads all the night long, your soul shall stay enough within it to know what they do, and feel the weight of the golden dress on its shoulders, and the furrow of the crown edge on the skull, no more. Would you take the offer, verbally made by the death angel? Would the meanest among us take it, think you? Yet practically and verily we grasp at it, every one of us, in a measure, many of us grasp at it in its fullness of horror. Every man accepts it, who desires to advance in life without knowing what life is, who means only that he is to get more horses, and more footmen, and more fortune, and more public honour, and, not more personal soul. He only is advancing in life, whose heart is getting softer, whose blood warmer, whose brain quicker, whose spirit is entering into living peace. And the men who have this life in them are the true lords or kings of the earth, they, and they only. All other kingships, so far as they are true, are only the practical issue and expression of theirs. If less than this, they are either dramatic royalties, costly shows, set off, indeed. With real jewels instead of tinsel, but still only the toys of nations, or else, they are no royalties at all, but tyrannies, or the mere active and practical issue of national folly, for which reason I have said of them elsewhere, visible governments are the toys of some nations, the diseases of others, the harness of some, the burdens of more. 43. But I have no words for the wonder with which I hear kinghood still spoken of, even among thoughtful men, as if governed nations were a personal property, and might be bought and sold or otherwise acquired, 
as sheep, of whose flesh their king was to feed, and whose fleece he was to gather, as if Achilles indignant epithet of base kings. People eating, were the constant and proper title of all monarchs, and enlargement of a king's dominion meant the same thing as the increase of a private man's estate. Kings who think so, however powerful, can no more be the true kings of the nation than gadflies are the kings of a horse, they suck it, and may drive it wild, but do not guide it. They, and their courts, and their armies are, if one could see clearly, only a large species of marsh mosquito, with bayonet proboscis and melodious, band-mastered, trumpeting in the summer air, the twilight being, perhaps, sometimes fairer, but hardly more wholesome, for its glittering mists of midge companies. The true kings, meanwhile, rule quietly, if at all, and hate ruling, too many of them make il gran refuto, 18, and if they do not, the mob, as soon as they are likely to become useful to it, is pretty sure to make its gran refuto of them. 44. Yet the visible king may also be a true one, some day, if ever day comes when he will estimate his dominion by the force of it, not the geographical boundaries. It matters very little whether Trent cuts you a cantel out here, or Ayn rounds you a castle less there. But it does matter to you, king of men, whether you can verily say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. Whether you can turn your people. As you can Trent, and where it is that you bid them come, and where go. It matters to you, king of men, whether your people hate you, and die by you, or love you, and live by you. You may measure your dominion by multitudes better than by miles, and count degrees of love latitude, not from, but to a wonderfully warm and indefinite equator. 45. Measure. Nay, you cannot measure. Who shall measure the difference between the power of those who do and teach, and who are greatest in the kingdoms of earth, as of heaven, and the power of those who undo, and consume, whose power, at the fullest, is only the power of the moth and the rust. Strange. To think how the moth kings lay up treasures for the moth, and the rust kings, who are to their people's strength as rust to armor, lay up treasures for the rust, and the robber kings, treasures for the robber, but how few kings have ever laid up treasures that needed no guarding, treasures of which, the more thieves there were, the better. Broidered robe, only to be rent, helm and sword, only to be dimmed, jewel and gold. Only to be scattered, there have been three kinds of kings who have gathered these. Suppose there ever should arise a fourth order of kings, who had read, in some obscure writing of long ago, that there was a fourth kind of treasure, which the jewel and gold could not equal, neither should it be valued with pure gold. A web made fair in the weaving, by Athena's shuttle, an armor, forged in divine fire by Vulcanian force, a goal to be mined in the sun's red heart. Where he sets over the Delphian cliffs, deep pictured tissue, impenetrable armor, potable gold. The three great angels of conduct, toil, and thought, still calling to us, and waiting at the posts of our doors, to lead us, with their winged power, and guide us, with their unerring eyes, by the path which no fowl knoweth, and which the vulture's eye has not seen. Suppose kings should ever arise, who heard and believed this word, and at last gathered and brought forth treasures of, wisdom, for their people. 46. Think what an amazing business that would be. How inconceivable, in the state of our present national wisdom, that we should bring up our peasants to a book exercise instead of a bayonet exercise. Organize, drill, maintain with pay, and good generalship, armies of thinkers, instead of armies of stabbers. Find national amusement in reading rooms as well as rifle grounds, give prizes for a fair shot at a fact, as well as for a leaden splash on a target. What an absurd idea it seems, put fairly in words, that the wealth of the capitalists of civilized nations should ever come to support literature instead of war. 47. Have yet patience with me, while I read you a single sentence out of the only book, properly to be called a book, that I have yet written myself, the one that will stand, if anything stand, surest and longest of all work of mine. It is one very awful form of the operation of wealth in Europe that it is entirely capitalists' wealth that supports unjust wars. Just wars do not need so much money to support them, 
for most of the men who wage such, wage them gratis, but for an unjust war, men's bodies and souls have both to be bought, and the best tools of war for them besides. Which makes such war costly to the maximum, not to speak of the cost of base fear, and angry suspicion, between nations which have not grace nor honesty enough in all their multitudes to buy an hour's peace of mind with, as, at present, France and England, purchasing of each other ten million sterling worth of consternation, annually, a remarkably light crop, half thorns and half aspen leaves, sown, reaped, and granaried by the science of the modern political economist, teaching covetousness instead of truth. And, all unjust war being supportable, if not by pillage of the enemy, only by loans from capitalists, these loans are repaid by subsequent taxation of the people, who appear to have no will in the matter. The capitalists will being the primary root of the war, but its real root is the covetousness of the whole nation, rendering it incapable of faith, frankness, or justice, and bringing about, therefore, in due time, his own separate loss and punishment to each person. 48. France and England literally, observe, by panic of each other, they pay, each of them, for ten thousand thousand pounds worth of terror, a year. Now suppose, instead of buying these ten millions worth of panic annually, they made up their minds to be at peace with each other, and buy ten millions worth of knowledge annually, and that each nation spent its ten thousand thousand pounds a year in founding royal libraries, royal art galleries, royal museums, royal gardens, and places of rest. Might it not be better somewhat for both French and English? 49. It will be long, yet, before that comes to pass. Nevertheless, I hope it will not be long before royal or national libraries will be founded in every considerable city, with a royal series of books in them, the same series in every one of them, chosen books, the best in every kind, prepared for that national series in the most perfect way possible. Their text printed all on leaves of equal size, broad of margin, and divided into pleasant volumes, light in the hand, beautiful, and strong, and thorough as examples of Binder's work, and that these great libraries will be accessible to all clean and orderly persons at all times of the day and evening, strict law being enforced for this cleanliness and quietness. I could shape for you other plans for art galleries, and for natural history galleries, and for many precious, many, it seems to me, needful, things, but this book plan is the easiest and needfulest, and would prove a considerable tonic to what we call our British constitution, which has fallen dropsical of late, and has an evil thirst, and evil hunger. And wants healthier feeding. You have got its corn laws repealed for it, try if you cannot get corn laws established for it dealing in a better bread, bread made of that old enchanted Arabian grain, the sesame, which opens doors, doors not of robbers, but of king's treasuries. 50. Note to paragraph 30. Respecting the increase of rent by the deaths of the poor, for evidence of which, see the preface to the medical officer's report to the Privy Council, just published, there are suggestions in its preface which will make some stir among us, I fancy, respecting which let me note these points following. There are two theories on the subject of land now abroad, and in contention, both false. The first is that, by heavenly law, there have always existed, and must continue to exist, a certain number of hereditarily sacred persons to whom the earth, air, and water of the world belong, as personal property, of which earth, air, and water, these persons may, at their pleasure, permit, or forbid, the rest of the human race to eat, breathe, or to drink. This theory is not for many years longer tenable. The adverse theory is that a division of the land of the world among the mob of the world would immediately elevate the said mob into sacred personages, that houses would then build themselves, and corn grow of itself, and that everybody would be able to live, without doing any work for his living. This theory would also be found highly untenable in practice. It will, however, require some rough experiments, and rougher catastrophes before the generality of persons will be convinced that no law concerning anything, least of all concerning land, for either holding or dividing it, or renting it high, or renting it low, would be of the smallest ultimate use to the people, so long as the general contest for life, and for the means of life, 
remains one of mere brutal competition. That contest, in an unprincipled nation, will take one deadly form or another, whatever laws you make against it. For instance, it would be an entirely wholesome law for England. If it could be carried, that maximum limits should be assigned to incomes according to classes, and that every nobleman's income should be paid to him as a fixed salary or pension by the nation, and not squeezed by him in variable sums, at discretion, out of the tenants of his land. But if you could get such a law passed tomorrow, and if, which would be far the necessary, you could fix the value of the assigned incomes by making a given weight of pure bread for a given sum, a twelve month would not pass before another currency would have been tacitly established, and the power of accumulative wealth would have reasserted itself in some other article, or some other imaginary sign. There is only one cure for public distress, and that is public education, directed to make men thoughtful, merciful, and just. There are, indeed, many laws conceivable which would gradually better and strengthen the national temper, but, for the most part, they are such as the national temper must be much better before it would bear. A nation in its youth may be helped by laws, as a weak child by backboards, but when it is old it cannot that way straighten its crooked spine. And besides, the problem of land, at its worst, is a by one, distribute the earth as you will, the principal question remains inexorable, who is to dig it? Which of us, in brief words, is to do the hard and dirty work for the rest, and for what pay? Who is to do the pleasant and clean work, and for what pay? Who is to do no work, and for what pay? And there are curious moral and religious questions connected with these. How far is it lawful to suck a portion of the soul out of a great many persons, in order to put the abstracted psychical quantities together and make one very beautiful or ideal soul? If we had to deal with mere blood, instead of spirit, and the thing might literally be done, as it has been done with infants before now, so that it were possible by taking a certain quantity of blood from the arms of a given number of the mob, and putting it all into one person, to make a more as your blooded gentleman of him. The thing would of course be managed, but secretly, I should conceive. But now, because it is brain and soul that we abstract, not visible blood, it can be done quite openly, and we live, we gentlemen, on delicatest prey. After the manner of weasels, that is to say, we keep a certain number of clowns digging and ditching, and generally stupefied, in order that we, being fed gratis, may have all the thinking and feeling to ourselves. Yet there is a great deal to be said for this. A highly bred and trained English, French, Austrian, or Italian gentleman, much more a lady, is a great production, a better production than most statues, being beautifully coloured as well as shaped, and plus all the brains, a glorious thing to look at, a wonderful thing to talk to, and you cannot have it. Any more than a pyramid or a church, but by sacrifice of much contributed life. And it is, perhaps, better to build a beautiful human creature than a beautiful dome or steeple, and more delightful to look up reverently to a creature far above us, than to a wall, only the beautiful human creature will have some duties to do in return, duties of living belfry and rampart, of which presently. This lecture was given December 6, 1864, at Rush Home Town Hall, Manchester, in aid of a library fund for the Rush Home Institute. End of the lecture. Thank you.